G'day and welcome again to another pa campfire panel discussion. And today, I first of all, I have with me Heather Joy Bassett, who is a speaker, a world champion lacrosse athlete, and a devoted grandmother. Welcome uh, to the campfire, Heather. Hi, thanks for the warm welcome and great to be here with all of you. It's good to have you here because this is the first panel you've been on. We've had the one-on-one -on -one talk before, so it's great to have you here to share your knowledge yeah. in the panel. Yeah, and then look we forward. have Excellent. And then we have uh, John Hope, who is a life and business strategist. How are you, John? I'm oh, great, thanks, Alan. How are you? Good, thanks. Very good. And it's good to have <laughs> you here back, back again. Thanks, Mike. I'm looking at that smile on you, and I know that there's going to be some trouble coming up, so we'll see how we go. <laughs> and then we also have uh, Scott Carson, who is, excuse me, <coughs> who is a men's coach and host of the Sunday uh, uh, Club. Welcome uh, along, uh, Scott. Thanks for having me again, Alan. I look forward to today's conversation. Excellent. So, and today's subject came from uh, John. It was about how fear-based uh, emotions cripple us from within, and the only thing that cures fear is action. So great subject, and I thought that would be a brilliant one to have today. But John, what did what uh, triggered you to come up with that particular subject? Um, basically me mental health. Uh, mm -hmm. A lot of, um, well, as you know, I was in the police. I got out and I got a bit motivated with a lot of friends that, you know, committed suicide or had been dependent on um, prescribed and non-prescribed drug things that don't work. Um, they've been locked up in uh, institutions where they see their family for an hour on a Sunday, like all that sort of stuff. And I went through the same stuff as them, but I was told by Roger Peters, who you know, that um, mm. I was diagnosed with PTSD, but he sort of said to me, I don't suffer from it like others because of the way I action my fear. Mm. So, yeah, so fear, uh, he, he's the one who's encouraged me to, to, to go down the road where, which has got me even talking to you here today. Mm. But he said, uh, but, what most people don't realise, and I, I learnt this from a, a martial arts background. I had an Australian title of fighting and a um, fourth down Taekwondo, and you learn straight away that you've got to, you know, fear destroys your clarity of thought. You've got to change. Once, once you're faced with it, you change your physiology, you've got to change your mental state, you've got to and then it's about actions and results. If you take the wrong action, then you get the wrong result. Um, most, people, most people don't realise that, or well, they do on a subconscious level, Every single action you take and every decision you make is born out of one of two emotions, mm. love and fear. Mm. Now, once you do that and you decide which way you're going to take it, mm. once, once you make that decision, your endocrine system kicks in. And I don't want to get into the big words, but that releases all the really good toxins or bad toxins mm. in your body. Mm. So if it's made out of love, you don't have to worry about that because you know the, your body is feeding itself mm. on all the good stuff. But if it's made out of fear, fear is like an alarm clock. And we're in a um, fear is the thing that you go, okay, I've got to take action. Um, sorry, I just saw someone was coming from my front door. So, we're, and, and we're in a, a thing at the moment where, um, like, in, in a, a, a time where as soon as we hear an alarm go off, we hit the snooze button. Mm. And we, we do that in life too. And when you do that, the fear manifests itself into depression, anxiety, um, guilt you know, uh, stress, all that sort of stuff, which we create. And then if you don't, and, and if you still don't treat it, then it turns into chronic pain, disease, and all that sort of stuff, which I've experienced myself. So it's more about um, educating people to action fear. And we're in a society that feeds off the, the fear. Like our medical corporations, they don't want you well, they don't want you dead. Mm -hmm. They make money out of in between. That's where they mm -hmm. treat you. So they label you, you put on a treatment plan and they make their money out of treatment and giving you medication instead of teaching you mental health coping mechanisms and look, teaching you to take action on it. So, yeah, I, I, I just sort of be interesting to get everyone's view on that, on, mm -hmm. what, on what they think, like what, what are their what are their fears and, and, and do they take action on it? Excellent. Can I just ask, yeah. John, what were the actions you took to get past your fears? Mate, the... The thing I learned with fighting is you've got to take immediate action and people, you know, and I've had, like I'm the youngest male breast cancer person, I had to take action on that, I had four operations um, and, and it, the, the action that you, you, the initial stage usually is just keeping yourself right, you know, mm -hmm. keeping yourself in the right frame of mind, so you've got to change your physiology, you know, I learned in martial arts, you change your physiology, like you stand up, all of a sudden mm -hmm. you change the chemical balance of your body, okay, if you 
And then mental health thing, like if you need to do breath work, you know, which um, Wim Hof teaches doing certain breath, changes the chemical balance of your body. If you need to get help with someone, what, whatever it is to change your mental state, then do that. But then your action, whatever the problem is, you've got to find the action. And we're in a society where um, we've got a lot of victim mentality and the only person that can pull you out of a victim mentality is you. Mm. And if you, if you don't do that by taking action and moving forward, then that's when all the disease, the depression and all that kicks in. So every, when, when I mean taking action, it's everything. But the, the mm. problem is not taking action and letting it manifest into something that it shouldn't be. Mm because we didn't take action. Yeah. As a, an athlete, um, Heather, you would have uh, noticed a lot of uh, this sort of stuff yourself in your training and watching other people in their sports. What sort of things did you, um, how do you see what uh, John's been talking about? Yeah, interesting. Um, we have parallels of, around the mental health, parallels around the, the health um, the health conditions that we, we've had, the PTSD and stuff like that. So, um, and one of, one of my takes is um, as we look at fear, because um, you mentioned that we had two, that we had two feelings, and one of the things I play with is four, which is anger, sadness, joy, and fear. And one of the things is that fear often get, gets made really wrong, and fear in itself isn't isn't wrong. It's it's how we respond to it and what we do. Mm. But fear is also our intuition. Fear is our guidance system. So there's a lot of people saying, have no fear, have no fear. Well, like, great, there's a bus coming. I'm just going to step out in front of it because I've got no fear. Yeah, like, true. it doesn't work. And my, I was walking my grandson out to the car and he's like, Grandma, Grandma, bit scary, Grandma, bit scary, Grandma. And we're walking out to this SUV that he's never been to. So he's a tiny little kid, 18 months old. He's looking at this big green thing. And he was scared, but out of my mouth was about to come, it's not scary. Hmm. Now, so right from when we're really young, we screw up. Hmm. We tell kids they're not scared when they're scared. Like he was, his whole body hmm. was in fear. So, yeah, I find that the interesting, interesting thing, if we didn't make fear wrong and we learned hmm. how to action it and then we knew that it was our guidance system. Hmm. And just because we have fear doesn't mean it stops us doing anything. But it's like fear, okay, am I safe? Is it my intuition? What's kicking in here? Mm. But then people get caught in that in that paralysis of we don't know how to how to move that forward. But so one of my friends has just done a TED talk and he calls it the meta fear revolution. And he's like, fear is a gateway to life itself. So mm. so again, it's how do we interpret it and what do we want to do? But mm. without action then again, yeah, fear totally paralyzes us. Mm. Yeah, so it's definitely a case of needing to uh, make sure you keep those emotions and that with you, knowing that they all have a purpose, it's like anger. It depends, you know, you need to have anger to be able to look after your family and things like somebody attacks your family, you want to be able to protect them. If you turn the other cheek, it wouldn't be good for them. But knowing, as you said, it's the appropriateness of actually using those emotions. So fear tells you that something's wrong. It's great that the, your grandson felt that fear, That'll keep him alive and keep him safe, as you said, that guidance system. But then also showing him, well, how to actually uh, uh, channel or uh, use that fear in the in the appropriate way that he can move forward. Well, and the thing for me is I was about to say it's not scary. Mm. And I just was like, oh, my God, like, that's what I was told. That's what I told my kids. Mm. They, were visi they were visibly scared and I would tell them. And I see it in playgrounds all over the place tell kids they're not scared when they ask when they are scared or well, what a mind mm. I'd swear there's an F word that wants to come up um, but, if we, hey, you're in the um, <laughs> but so I honored that and I said yeah it is a bit scary mm. but I've got you and it's safe mm. and then we were able to then we were able to get him into the into the into the car but to be dragging along saying oh no it's not scary that's just mm. crazy. So, like, we we get screwed up on what fear is from when we're when we're when we're this big. So, but yeah, we got him in the car without the dramas and without not validating what was real for him. Mm. Because to tell an eighteen month old that they're wrong, oh no, you're not scared. Yeah. Like, How does that work? It ends yeah. up where we are decades mm. later. <laughs>
Yeah, that ends up meaning that they don't trust you because they can't believe what you tell them because the fear is still going to be there for them. But you've negated their, whatever their emotion they're feeling at the time. All you're doing is separating yourself from the child. And But to acknowledge them first of all, yes, you're absolutely right. This can be scary. But as you said, I've got you. So here's you're showing him that you're actually looking after him as well. So the bond between you and him becomes closer anyway. So you're very right in the... We abbreviate too many things. We try and simplify things so much that we actually cause problems for ourselves. I just want to thank Heather, um, just quickly, because I've just taken uh, my son up to the Gold Coast and maybe he was a little bit young, four years old, when I put him on the pirate ship and it freaked him out a bit. Um, and we went on the roller coaster. <laughs> so I finally got him to go on the roller coaster. And I can see how what you just... <laughs> would make great practice because I literally, we've got to, I just Dad, I don't want to go. It's too scary. I remember the pirate ship. And I've just gone, it's not that scary. He looked at me and I could see it in his eyes. But then I said to him, I'm here with you. I'm not going to leave your side aside. It's safe. So that, thank you for sharing that because I've just reloaded myself on that. So, yep. <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, I'll jump in here now anyway, sorry. Please, get yeah, comfort. <laughs> on the Lo love and fear. I'm, I believe every action is based on that. Um, I'd be really interested to hear Heather's breakdown of the four concepts a little mm. bit later. Um, knowing, knowing myself and just my life and where I've been and what I've done, I've always acted out of fear up until about... Uh, eight years ago when I started to own my own stuff. And I took, took the action of actually taking a step forward to better myself, study things, understand things so that I could be the father that I wanted to be. That being said, for me, the gap between feeling the emotion and my response is becoming the biggest thing that I've learned. The action I take upon feeling that emotion that's the one thing that I've found to be the most pivotal part of me growing. Mm. Because in years gone by, my anger or my fear would come out and I'd act immediately. Whereas now, with love in my heart, I consider my action before I do actually take, take on that action. But I think it's 100% right. You cannot move forward without action. Mm. So... Sorry. Yeah, action, action. Go ahead, John. Action is the only thing that kills fear. You know, I, I've, I, I haven't got it. I've got it in front of me and I'll, I'd love to show it because it's a picture of Yoda. It looks so much like Alan. <laughs> and it says, it goes, fear is the part. You're talking about the, the ears or the wrinkles? <laughs> Pick one. <laughs> the <Behave. laughs> But he goes, uh, he says, fear is the path to the dark side. Fear leads to anger. Anger is fear in disguise. Mm. Like when someone's angry, it's scared. Like if you've got a kid, um, like you're saying with traffic, when a kid runs out on a traffic at that age, you get angry with them. And you're not actually angry with them. It's your fear that brings mm. that out. Same as road rage. Road rage, you're scared of getting hit. You're scared of having an accident or you're scared of being late. And that's a big one for a lot of people. They're scared of being late. So it's the anger comes from the fear of those things so if you're and the only way to action um fear is to actually physically action it and we don't have anything in our society at the moment that teaches it and if you've you, you become what i call a park car and you can't steer a park car you mm. know and i was talking to someone recently and i said well you actually right and, and and the park car the handbrake in the park car is the actual medical institution because mm. They actually, they, they don't want to, they make money out of, they don't make money out of you being well. They don't make money out of you being dead. And they're all medical institutions are backed, big corporations that are big businesses that have got one goal is to make money. It's not to make you well. Hmm. So if you, if you can't learn to take the action yourself, identify the fear, learn to stand up to it. You know, like I, I came from a, like I, I learned the, from a fighting perspective, that the only person that's going to get me out of harm's way is me. Hmm. So, and I didn't realize I put that across my whole life. And Roger, the 
psycholo psychologist I saw getting out, who's the foremost expert in PTSD and police, he identified that in me and I went, well, doesn't everyone do that? And he said, no. Hmm. So it's, it's, it's so, it's so big and, and I've got kids as we, we all have. And that's one of the main focuses for me is I've got to not only show them how to do it, but be an example of it because kids learn, they learn from you, you know, mm. and they, you're right. You can't just say, oh, don't be silly. The mm. fear's there for a reason. Like they've, they've learned the fear and they've, they've, you've got to learn, they've got to learn to process it, not, mm. not learn to be told that's wrong <coughs> because that, that doesn't work for any of us. And like, like, like Heather said, at a, at a young age, you can't process, I'm wrong. Well, hang on, this is coming up. They, they more need to be guided along the, okay, if you're scared, you need to take action. So you need to learn to stand back from the curve. And yeah, it's a truck and yeah, it can hurt you if you you go out in front of it, but you need to learn the boundaries so that you can operate safely within within that. And then once you have your boundaries in place and you know that, you're no longer scared. Hmm. Yeah, because actually when you're talking to the child, you're explaining to them and, you know, look, the truck's in front of them, like that uh, four wheel drive, the SUV, as you said, they're scared of that and saying to them, yes, that is that is scary, but I'm here and that to help you. But also once we get inside the vehicle, because it's so big, it's going to protect us as well. So it becomes our protector. So you can talk about all those things and explain to the child. The more we, we talk to the child, the more they understand it. And then they can start to take action. And we're helping them taking that action because as you said, Heather, we're there, you know, you're there with your grandson and taking him to the car. So he knew he was being protected. But as they say, courage is not the, um, the absence of fear. Courage is in the presence of fear. People yeah. who don't feel fear, well, there's no, it's not really courage. There's not, they're not applying themselves. They're not testing themselves. The fear, as you said, Heather, that's guidance that centers in the right direction to get us motive, you know, moving, but then how we handle it and to, to handle it, we've got to take action. There's no other choice, as you've said. There's um, some other work, because you two have uh, you both mentioned that there being love and fear. So one of the things I've explored, and there's some research, so unfortunately, I'm not good at quoting where the research came, so I can, I can follow it up if you want. Um, but there is, that there's four primary feelings, which is anger, sadness, um, fear, and joy. And anger is our clarity. Without anger, that's quite difficult to have clarity. Sadness is the communicator, the connector, the empath that connects humanity. Fear is our, um, and again, happy to play with it, happy for it not to be real for someone else. But fear is our intuition and our guidance. And then joy is our, <laughs> is our natural state of being underneath it. But one of the things that we explored in that was if you mix fear and sadness, so they actually become mixed, then that's when people get isolated because they're, they're fear and sad. So to, to mix two things, whereas if you can separate it, then you don't have the feeling of isolation. The other one, which we may know um, having lived some life, is um, if you mix fear and joy, that's often like the midlife crisis. It's um, you're scared because you don't know what's happening, but hey, whatever. And then that creates carelessness. Because like, hey, you know, I've done the jet ski and the jumping out of the aeroplane and because like I'm scared, but hey, you know, I'm, I'm in a joy space. So that carelessness is, you know, then that's the, the middle aged motorbike accident, car accident, stuff like that. And then another one is if you mix anger and fear, then you've got the hysteria, which is like, <sighs> mm. and, and it's interesting for me to explore those because if we separate them, then, okay, what is it you're angry about and what is it you're scared about or what is it you're scared about and what is it you're sad about um, and what are you sad about and what are you joyous about? So that's another interesting one to um, to explore is the raw, the raw fear on its own mm. without, without having anything else like thrown in like a cocktail um, and then looking, yeah, looking at how pure that um, fear is. And then I also read some other research that we're born with two fears. That's it. And everything else is learned. But again, that learning, the fear is also what protects us. We know not mm. to jump off that cliff, you know? Um, that's what it's there for. That's right. Yeah, that's, that's what it's there for. Yeah. Yeah, but I like adding, as you've said, the other two areas there, you add that to it. When you look at fear, it gives you that 
which direction is the fear going in? Is it going to that you know, place where we're just not taking any care whatsoever or are we moving off towards the, um, uh, you know, the paranoia and being crippled away from people? So it gives us an understanding, saying, okay, someone's feeling fear, but what direction is it taking them in? It's a negative direction, but is it taking the one where they're going to pull away and be totally isolated? Or is another one where they're just going to be out there doing stupid things and putting themselves at risk and other people around them at risk? And I've probably done them all. <laughs> I guarantee that we've, most of us have done all of them. <laughs> Part of being human. It's, um, well, as Scott asked before, and, and, and one of the things I work with, like we, we get fear. Fear becomes depression, stress, anger, and all that sort of stuff. The opposite to that is what every religion teaches you and every philosopher teaches you. You know, like you can't be practicing forgiveness and gratitude and be angry at the same time. You just can't. Mm. You know, it, it's, it's, um, if you are, you're not doing it right. And most of the time, when, um, like religions all talk about that, being grateful, having forgiveness, having hope, having, uh, and being charitable. Chari charity, and, and, and it's all two phase. Most of us bash ourselves up. And if we are in a position where the fear isn't real, like if it is real, then you need to learn, go to that gratitude, forgiveness, find the joy, find the, find the charity, um, find like the, whatever you need to do, find the hope, find, find the love. How do I love someone better? How do I love myself better? That sort of stuff. But if, if you can't get up to that, 90% of the time, the fear is bullshit, mm. you know? And in the police, I learned, um, when you interview someone, lies are one dimensional, mm. right? And if you ask three dimensional questions, they're called cognitive interviewing techniques. Once you start trying to color in a lie, people can't do it. So if someone's mm. said, oh yeah, I was at this house. Cool, what house was it? What, what did the front look like? Where was, was there a clock inside the door? If you straight away, you can tell a lie because that person has no idea. And mm. it's the same with, with a fear that's not true because once you start asking questions about it, they then go, well, hang on, that, that's not real. And like the old saying, I think it was, is it uh, Dale Cunningham, a person convinced against their will is of the same opinion still. Mm. You know, like you can't, if, if, but if they find it, and that's the same, that's, that's bottom line with sales. Once someone finds the value instead of you telling them the value. Mm. So if they start getting their own conclusions, going, hang on, this is bullshit. They're straight away done. That's done. The fear's mm. gone. And mm. then once, like I, I interviewed Brooke Shields last year on stage and she talked about um, stress. She, she, she suffered severely from, um, oh, what's it called? Uh, the postpartum depression with your kids. Mm. And she's written books on it. And I asked her about uh, overcoming adversity and that. And she said, um, she likened it to surfing, which we have in Australia, but not so much in America. And she was scared of the waves. And then they showed her how to duck dive, she called it something else, under the wave. But once that wave came well, and, and passed over her and she had the confidence, the next wave she wasn't scared of. Hmm. Cause she'd taken the action, she cured the fear. So, you know, and, and that's, that's when it's a real fear. Hmm. So you, you do the action, but when it's not, you can usually discuss it and, and, and with someone or a third person and get through it. So, and, and a lot of the time when you get the fear and you get the, and then you get depression and anxiety and all that, what happens? You close yourself off mm. from people, you know, you, your worth goes down, your self-worth goes down and you don't, you isolate yourself. When you isolate yourself, you cut yourself off com from communication. So it's like, it, it, it's something that happens across the board and I've seen happen with a lot of police that have, that have you know, gotten out of the cops, but it, it's, it's self-sabotage to a, to a certain extent. Like we're actually, actually hurting ourself when all we need to do if we can talk more you know and, and that's been broken down too like we're broken families and all that sort of stuff now you know their parents are guilt ridden they're like they're too scared of disciplining or showing hard things because they're scared the child will want the other parent more like there's so many factors that come in um there's that steve illard that i think i've mentioned to you hmm. alan and he talks about what was his term that depression is the result of civilization mm. because all the people that lived in tribes and things like that don't suffer depression mm. you know they, but we're we're, we're at, a, at, at a at a critical point we've got a worldwide stress epidemic mm. in first world countries 
Mm. Not in third world countries, mm. in first world countries. Yeah, you see a lot so, of those things come back to the, the technology because I know that the fastest growing industry in the world at the moment is technology. We're more connected by devices than we've ever been connected before. The second fastest growing um, industry is coaching. And that's because everybody is disconnected from themselves and from each other. We're connected via devices, but relationships and emotionally we're disconnected from each other. So it's exactly as you said, John, yeah. we're not in that tribal state that we used to be. And in that tribal state, we have connection. That's right. Yeah. There's no There's community. Been- Spent a lot of time with the boys on Sundays and just in general conversation on their go to with a lot of issues. And one thing that keeps coming up is a fear of conversation and being honest. Mm. And once fear once, of being criticized, yeah, absolutely. So, and but that that honesty and just it takes on a lot, especially I've got a lot of guys around me in their 40s to 50s. and having those conversations is becoming so hard. Mm. And I think it's because we don't, uh, we don't have a circle of people we trust. Mm. Lance Petroni always talks about um, having five people of influence in your life. Alan, you know, as we met, I changed my five immediately when I found out that you're the average of the five people you spend time with. Mm. But inside of that, knowing the if you have five people that you can go to and actually know what they're there for, i.e. Uh, Andy Bryce, if I've got some emotional stuff, Paul Purden, if I've got work stuff, Alan, for everything. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but, but since, since I've had um, people in my life that I've actually got as mentors, everything's much easier for me to communicate. Mm. I don't have that fear. And I... And that's one thing that I'm becoming really passionate about is helping guys communicate with their immediate family because it's something that, for me, once they take action and actually have a go at it and mm. say, even if they get it wrong, put their hand up and say, hey, listen, I might get this wrong, but this is what I'm trying to get across at the minute. Can you work with me? That action of actually putting your hand up and saying, I might get this wrong, but I'm going to have a go at it, mm. it just starts yeah. the ball rolling. As soon as the ball start, starts rolling, I love that. Um, So one of the messages I bring to the world, which was a gift from the universe, is spruce. It's a made-up word, S-P-R-U-T-H. I thought it it didn't sound familiar. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Um, And it's speaking truth, but it's much more that. that. It's speaking truth with love and compassion. Mm. And so when we create the safe space that I know that I'm speaking from love and compassion and I know that the person I'm speaking with is speaking from love and compassion then that opens I get goosebumps it opens up the space to have real conversations and in that space it's taking responsibility for what is deeply true for me and one of the fascinating things for me is as I speak now not now in this moment but when I'm speaking, I can t- almost taste and feel that, ugh, like truth can be you suck, they, them, all the outward stuff. Mm. And I can tell when I'm not speaking with love and compassion and it's like I'll be having a conversation and it's a moment to moment choice and then I'll be having conversation. I just stop and it's like, oh, I don't know what I'm saying here, but it's not spruce. Hmm. I'm not speaking my truth with love and compassion. And there are times where I just stop the conversation. It's just like, I don't even know where I was going. Hmm. The other thing that's really profound is that when you speak from this place, so you have a safety within yourself and the safety with who you're speaking with, then you say the stuff. And then as it comes out of your mouth, it's like that thing that was locked inside our body, that thought or that feeling that belief, it comes out and it's like, oh, what the, that's not even true anymore. Because once it's got space, it can transform and then we can transcend that and then we come from a totally different space. So that, so that five that you're having, that proximity, that power of five, having at that space where we have that safety and we know that we're in that space for together, it's, it's together. Um, whereas it's not divide and conquer. This is a space of safety mm. where how together do we move forward? Mm. Then the conversations we can have in that are just 
mind blowing and working with people around that, bringing it into workspaces and, and, and just into different groups and going, okay, well, here is a place of, you know, a campfire, we, we spruce. Then there's also, if someone is not taking responsibility and is in that victim mode, and victim mode is not, I, I have a thing that it's not necessarily wrong. It can be part of our evolution. Making it wrong stuffs it up even more. <coughs> but being in I'm that space, sorry. but then, but then we can take ownership of like, oof, I'm mm. really in victim mode right now. Mm. I'm real, and and again, it's that taking ownership and taking responsibility from that space of love and compassion that, um, yeah, things just that things change within us, and then then with with others and then the ripples ripples around the family the team everything changes as as well yeah. i'm going to ask for that how you actually start that conversation because um asking from a female perspective because one thing that kenny marmarella de cruz said that i have employed on sorry get the pen down <laughs> talking my hands a bit um, that's, a, that's good <laughs> yeah, don't take out an eye <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> Can you, can you mention that, um, that when he speaks to his partner, do yeah. you want me to listen to you or do you want me to fix this? Mm. So I've, that's, yeah, sorry. I've applied that to a few conversations now and yeah. it makes a world of difference when I'm dealing with my partner. Yeah. How would you open that space with somebody to actually get that interaction from both? So... So part of spruce because there's a, there's a process to it being checking that you're safe, being really present, being radically honest with what you're thinking, not the facade, being radically honest with what you're feeling, and then it is asking for what um, and saying. So now with people, I don't say, "Hey, we're having spruce time," because it just is that that is where I come from, and I own when I'm not coming from that. So for some people, I'm like, go watch the eight minute video and then have a discussion and go, hey, how about we try this? But then in part of that is like when I, when I am speaking is then asking for what I need, asking for what I desire because all evolution, everything starts within itself. So spruce is a start with self journey and then it's saying, okay, I need to be witnessed. I need validation. Mm. I'm looking for possibilities. And quite often, um then like i'm really good at giving people possibilities but they don't want possibilities a family member next door it's like it's taken me you know taking me a, f a fair while to go no no I, I just want validation or i just want to be witness but i didn't have these skills so then i'd go oh well here's here's a possibility here's how to fix it it's like so then when we do that then we're missing the empathy mm. and when we miss the empathy it's like yeah <laughs> game over <laughs> game over if there's not unless because i also play in other places where we have if we're stuck in story it's like the and they give us a possibility it's like go again so if you start to try and say the same story they just interrupt you and go well how's that working for you it's like no come from another angle, come from another angle. So if we have that awareness that I'm in a space where I want possibilities, give me possibilities. I don't want to be stuck in this loop hmm. versus, okay, I want to be witnessed and seen in my vulnerability and in my victim here. First, okay, I just, I want to be witnessed. So, and I know for me, like I'm 61 now, like even till probably 18 months ago, it's like, what do you need? I'd be like, I couldn't say, well, I want to be witnessed. I want to be validated. I wanted possibilities. I couldn't say what my needs were. I was too numb, too disconnected, too shut down. So, so that makes it harder when the other person is, you know, it's like, what are your needs? It's like a lot of people don't know and it's almost been conditioned out. Or again, it's so shoved down inside. So again, spruce is like getting all this stuff out. And then it's like, yeah, please don't give me possibilities. Yeah. Just, just see me, just see me in my glory or my mess or my vulnerability. Does that help? Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. I've just got a quick question on it though, because yep. 
that owning what you want clearly yes is that a good step to take in your mind because i that's sort of what i heard if i'm if i'm sharing from a place of love and compassion what's real for me yep. then if i can let the other person know what i need yep. then the boundaries are set there's very clear they know they know what their role in this now they can go no nah, i'm not going to be part of this they don't have to do that but for for the person to own this is this is what i need yep. this is what i desire this is this is what i want then there's very clear boundaries there's very clear boundaries set and most communication we don't have those boundaries and like the other person's left there going um, what do i say like what am i supposed to should i uh, I, I don't know what to do whereas if you're very clear on what you want the other person to do um that can be an absolute game changer if you've got the other person who doesn't know the person you're talking to who's in that state and they don't know what they really want. Yeah. How do you go about trying to get them to start to look at it, understand that they know it themselves and then articulate it back to you uh, so that you know what well, to do to help them? Well, yeah. So, so one of the things with Spruce is it, it's, it's my journey. So it's not putting the expectation on someone else's. Hmm. Once you have two or three people who know that, but otherwise I'm sharing my experience. So then it can be like, okay, I'm finding it really hard because I don't know what you need now mm. and I don't know what you want. And I would love to be able to give you that, but mm. I'm at a loss. So mm. if you can guide me in this um, and, and own what's real for us, mm. because the whole thing is owning what's real for us. Because if, if we're just standing there and it's like, I want no idea what to say. I don't know what to do. I'm just going to piss off and go to the pub and just like ignore it and hope it doesn't happen because we feel uncomfortable. Hmm. Then again, that, that doesn't help communication move, communication move forward. Now, if you're the person Does who's that... listening to somebody else, somebody yep. else can see they've got some issues, they want to deal with it, but they don't yep. really know how to articulate it. We're sitting there, we want to help them. So it starts to become about us because we're feeling uncomfortable. Yeah, we want to get and you know get to a solution for them, and that's when we step. You know, I, I believe that I've stepped in in the past and tried to fix issues because is you're uncomfortable. Saying, well, look, I I really want to help you, but I've got no idea of how to help you. Can you articulate a little bit more or explain a bit more what it is yeah. that you really want, so I then know how to actually support you? Is that what you're? Yeah, and don't you don't use the word articulate. Um, <laughs> that's that's that's, that's, that's not my well. well yeah. It's not my yeah, average conversation. Don't use articulate. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, that'd be like, oh, we in some therapy session or something like that. Yeah. But, but yeah, again, it comes back to being real, but most of us, and like, I'm still guilty of this at times. I'm like, I, you know, I'm really uncomfortable and I don't know what to say. And then, but I don't share that. I'll share how to fix it or I'll just, go oh, I don't know and I walk away and then I'm like yeah not one not you know not my finer moments but again if with love and compassion I go okay this is where I hear you're at this is where I'm at okay all right mm -hmm. and then it creates and and the other extraordinary thing is is if we say the exact words back to someone have mm -hmm. any of you used that mm -hmm. mirroring and matching Mm. Yeah, marrying and matching. Then, then that that is, and again, if you've got that love and compassion, mm. builds yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Then that opens the space to go. Look, you know, I'm really uncomfortable. You say you're really uncomfortable. Yes, I'm really uncomfortable. Yes, you're really uncomfortable. Yes, I'm really uncomfortable. And then you just know there goes the next half an hour because you've allowed the space for the person mm. to feel safe because that's the thing it's mm. with with spruce as well is, is you have to feel safe because if you don't feel safe it's conversations mm. aren't going to go anyway yeah so it's when the other person is unable to explain to you what's going on you're going to try and help them and as you said by showing that well you're showing your vulnerability that you know i don't really know myself what i'm like how i'd how to help you you're actually yep. coming closer to their level and they go well i've got no idea 
how to talk and at the same time you've got no idea of how to help me we're yep. both sort of lost and it's you're able to communicate with somebody who who's in an equal level whereas if they're right up here and you're feeling down here it's hard to connect with them mm. so, but if you've got boundaries that's what you've just learned in the sporting field mm. when you play rugby league it's unfair to go to someone get a kid throw them a football and send them out to an experienced football player and say go and play i'm not going to tell you the rules they need to know the boundaries. Yeah. They need to know the rules. And if you're going yeah. to have that, like Heather says, one of those sort of conversations where mm. you need something for the conversation, then you need to create, like, to to illustrate, excuse me, I'm speaking, illustrate to the other person the boundaries and what you need. And then once 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 you do the boundaries, you mm. you can then operate within those boundaries. And boundaries are needed everywhere in life. Mm. But if you mm. if if you don't tell them. Then the onus is geez, my door moved again. It frightened the hell out of me. But if, if you don't, um, if, if you don't do that, like then yeah, it's and, and like you say, a place a safe place with love and all that. Then you need to create that, and you need to yeah. create the boundaries. They need to be drawn down, and then you say, look here, this is where we're going. Let's do it. A lot of therapists yeah. do it by the first time they get to know you because they learn your boundaries. Mm. So yeah, so although. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I saw a psychiatrist for 15 years. I saw that. <laughs> and, um, and there were many things that I never spoke of. Hmm. So the thing is, the depth of safety that you can create, hmm. having been in therapists, having been in the medical profession myself for 40 years, um, is... You, there's often a miss in there's often a miss in that, and I again I've been in psych wards myself, mm. um, and people who who don't who still don't feel safe in those spaces. Mm. So so there is a bit of a gap, and I know a lot of people have issues with the medical field, and for me, you know, I'm really grateful because that's why I'm still here because of that because of the pills because of the whatever that that kept me here long enough to go huh. Let's try something different. You know, let's try something different. But yeah, they do to a level, but there's often another level that that can be is and my it's about experience. Breaking down their fear because if they're scared, yeah. there's fear. Mm. So you got to break down that fear. You got to identify mm. it before you can break it down. Mm. Mm. And that's like I learned that fighting. You have to, and then your action and your results mm. are crucial because like if I if, if I come into someone and I go. I throw a left hand and they can counter with a right and there's 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 two parts to this. I know either I've not blocked my chin or had my arm go out straight. And if I do have an impact coming that way, if I stand there and take it, it's gonna impact me much more than if I pivot and come around with another strike of my own. If that, if that makes sense. So you you can't always block it, but sometimes you have to go with it. It's like um, you dance with it. You know, like when we, 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 you, you go with it, either way it's going. You just got to learn to to um, adapt mm. to, to to what's happening. If you just stand there with, with, with where you haven't grown, you haven't learned, and you just go and bang, 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 then it, you just you're going to be a punching bag. Mm. So you've you've got to learn to take action. You got code. You, no one's going through anything that someone hasn't gone through before. Like mm. we're not in the Holocaust. We're not in shit, like. The worst that can happen to someone is they're on the dole sort of thing. And you, 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 yeah, people get hurt, but people have been hurt. That, that's life. Mm. You can't you can't get away from it. You've just got to learn to operate within your boundaries, as Heather said. And um, you, you've got to keep winning. You've got to keep achieving, operating out of love instead of out of fear. Because when you're in fear, you're moving. You're not. You're running from something. When you're in love, you're running to something. You're mm. never going to achieve a thing when you're living in fear. Because yeah. you're always going backwards. Mm. And as you said, with Heather said before, with the going into that depth of um, uh, of safety, well, the that brings a, a height of trust that comes with that. And the greater the trust that you have between you and the other person, whether you're trying to help them or they're trying to help you, the more the per, both parties will be honest and actually share more, and you get to greater results. But in yeah. all that process, as you said, John, they're taking action. If they're not taking action, sorry, I got scared again. <laughs> Can you excuse Do me? I, I want to lock my door. Call me Yoda. Yeah, I've got the force going, having you giving you a hard time over there. 
No, it's actually, it's not um, me, it's my dingo attacking my door, trying to push a way in. So I've just locked it because there's a bit of play in it and she's just been a little temperamental. <laughs> so, um, she can be. Yeah. The, the, greater, the greater the safety then the, and the greater the vulnerability, hmm. the greater the trust, hmm. and that's where people thrive. Hmm. That you have to have, you have to have safety to have that vulnerability, to build that trust. And, and that's, that's a space for thriving. And, and the lower the vulnerability, the lower the, the safety, the less trust, that's where people perish or people sit there. Mm. Um, if you were using workplace, you'd have presenteeism, which is everyone's like, yeah, it's fine, it's fine, it's fine. But that's to your face and to everything else it's not. Or you've got what absenteeism, you, what, sorry, which is... Sorry, what, what did you call it? Pre what was it Presenteeism. Called? Presenteeism. Okay. You're present. Cool. You're present, but you're not really you got the, yeah no i get it yeah. i get it i just i just missed the word sorry yeah and then I absenteeism like <laughs> yeah and and then it's not just in the workplace like where in your relationships are you present it's like yeah yeah it's fine yeah it's fine yeah it's fine mm. yeah it's fine um <laughs> and then you've got absenteeism which is like you know silence is deadly because that person is dying inside mm. doesn't feel safe can't be vulnerable and they're literally perishing on the inside and if someone's going oh come on mate you know come on come on get with it hmm. no safety no vulnerability they literally will perish so we need to create that or on the other side you've got high vulnerability no safety and then that's where you've just got the raging bully don't give a shit about anyone that's right i just i'm going to track back a little bit if that's okay one of the things with um just addressing heather that i think is absolutely fantastic is if you're sitting with someone and you say, and you're not sure how the conversations go, you don't actually know what to say at that point. So let's just say that. I don't know. What yeah. to, I don't know what to say right now, but I'm yeah. here with you. Yep. I want to work with you to see what we can do. And yeah. And then we'll sit in the silence. It's uncomfortable, but eventually someone will speak, and a normally yep. different person, and they'll share part of their story. Because yep. I I've had. Um, uh, how, what's the best kind of, what's the best words? An interesting relationship family wise. And at the moment I'm trying to work through, um, not necessarily to build a relationship, but to understand my father. And it's something that I have put off for a long time. And two weeks ago I went and sat with him and I didn't know what to say. And we met at a pub and not a great place for me because it brings up a lot of family stuff and i didn't know how to open the conversation so i just opened it with thank you for being here i'm not sure how this is going to go but i want to try to understand how we can work through this because for you to have a relationship with your grandson I have to see you through a different set of eyes so I can relay that to my wife and my son. So I want to take the time to get to know you. Well is, done, you. Is that okay? Mm. Well done. That's the hardest conversation I've ever had in my life. Mm. But yeah. that option, and I said to my father, I said, you're not a bad man. I said, shit's happened in life. We all make mistakes. So I shared some with him that I made. To, hope, to hopefully break down. Now, I haven't had my second conversation yet. And whew, has that been a hard one? But I'm, looking, I'm actually looking forward to it mm. because I've put my hand up and I don't actually know how to have that. Mm. But I know it's important. So fear, massive, but I'm taking yeah. it. And that's why today, for me, is a really, really important one to listen mm. because it has crippled me. It has stopped me doing a lot of things in life. But now because I'm wanting to take action and knowing that if I do take action, the reward's going to be in my own head. It's nowhere else. Yeah. Um, yeah. There'll be more ripples. There'll be more ripples. Yeah. yeah. Can, can, I, can I ask you something, Scott? Yeah. Are you coming from a place of love or a place of fear? Because if Absolutely. you're coming from a place of fear, you're scared about what's going to happen. Because love's more about understanding, not judging, yeah. not finger pointing. Whereas when you come from a place of fear, you do that. 
and nothing productive will come from a place of fear. Mm. And you can overthink things and you get scared. So mm. I, 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 my suggestion, and I, I've had similar experiences, yep. would be to, um, to work out what you want to get from the conversation. Are you wanting to get a resolution or are you wanting to get, um, what do you call it? Um, like, are you looking to have a crack back? I can't think of the word. Like, are you are you looking to punish him or are you looking to forgive him, love no. him, work forward? Like, and I'm not saying that in, in yeah. it, like, it's it's black and white and I'm not saying it, I'm not, I'm not um, pointing fingers at you. I'm just saying that that's something to have a think about because if you're not coming from the right places this whole conversation started on, you're not going to go to the right place. Mm. Yeah, right. I, I am wrapped that you've come to me with that question mm. because years gone by, 100% fear and anger. Years gone by. Mm. I've grown. I've worked solely on myself to improve myself. My, I'm coming from a complete place, place of love. One of my good friends um, is having a lot of trouble with his children and all he wants is them in his life. I've got my son in my life who is my world, who's been my biggest teacher, the, my, I just love having him, having him because he's taught me and shown me different things and made me be the man who I'm becoming. I look at that and I see that and I'm like, how much pain would I be in if my son never spoke to me? Hmm. I don't think any man deserves that. I think just to understand him and where he come from, it's gonna, that's all I want to do. It's a place of love, but it's taken me a long time and a lot of reflection on me and learning to deal, deal with myself, opening up that space between emotion and action and actually choosing how, that, how, how I deal with that. It took a lot of self work for me to be able to have that conversation. So that coming from fear, was a place in the past and there was an angry, angry man. It's not the case anymore. And I'm, I'm so grateful you asked that question because it's clarified it again for me in my own head because it's one of my big things now and I, I'm, and I just want for people is to talk about their life and their love and their situations and own their shit because that's how we grow. That's how we grow as a community. That's how... That's all I want to do with people. I want to sit with people and help them get through those conversations that they can't have. Give them the tools to be able to do that. I'm doing that through my own experience. Mm. And my past is, is different and everyone's got a story and, you know, each, and, yeah. mm. and, and like everybody, no, no one's getting them through life without it. But to be able to come from love rather than fear is a must when you're having tough conversations. Yeah. The, okay. the key too is forgiveness with love mm. and that religion talks about it now forgiveness yeah. isn't judgment now but yeah. also they you you don't have to forget like mm. people can hurt you and they can knowingly hurt you it's you don't absorb that that's that's their thing everyone's entitled to tr do whatever they want to do yeah. now forgiving doesn't mean forgetting Agreed. forgiving is disburdening the self that's it, letting yourself go from the whole situation. Yeah, so and I've got several several instances with my um, parents where I've had to forgive. Doesn't mean you forget. Mm. Doesn't mean you let them do it again. But you got to forgive. You got to let. You got to drop that shit. Mm. Sorry, I said shit. No, no. I didn't say. <laughs> I didn't say the f word like Heather was going to. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> it's, it's, I can see that, you know, and what I felt as well. Things in the past where. I've been fearful of actually having a, a talk to somebody. Then when I've had that wanting to really want to do it because I wanted great results. So coming from that place in of love, also the forgiveness for myself, letting that stuff go. There was still a little bit of fear because you can't just go from one to the other straight away. There's a bit of a transition. So yeah, is that something that you've been feeling along the way, yeah, Scott? But there's gratitude too. Before Scott answers, if I may throw that in because he might put this into his answer. There's gratitude because you're obviously a kind, caring person that's going to be a good father, committed, and you're very um, considerate of your child's feelings. Would you be that way if you hadn't experienced what you've experienced? So right. there comes a level of gratefulness. Well, you've got to be grateful for that person. Hmm. Yeah, sure, they gave you shit, but if they didn't give you shit, you wouldn't be that way. 
That's it. We are the sum of all. Does that, does that make sense? Oh, I'm sorry, sorry Alan. Yeah. Alan, ask your question again. Yeah. <laughs> but you're oh, I, I, of, all your, of everything you've experienced. So the sum of all of that. So all of that <laughs> got to be. If you're happy with who you are now and where you're heading, then all of that stuff you've got to be grateful for, regardless of what it was. But as you said, John, it's not uh, forgetting it, but ma and making sure that nobody else does it to you again in the future. But allowing yourself to release yourself from all that, which you know, because you hang on to it, it's holding you back. Gratitude's mm. everything to me now. Yeah. Absolutely everything. Like I can't, I'm to say, to say that I'm grateful for my for my life is an understatement. Mm. I believe I am the wealthiest man on earth. I have beautiful conversations. Can I have a load? Hey, I'm not. I one thing. I'm learning that financial reward needs to happen, but I'm wealthy because I get to know you. I get. I get to feel you. I. I, I get to enjoy people's heart and soul because in life that's all I want. I want. I want to know you. That's the best gift I can give you and me is to know you. Mm. And I just. That's oh. when I just feel so wealthy. You know, and it's it's a beautiful place, and it's simply because I can have these hard conversations, and I I'm, I honestly believe as a society and as a community, all, with all the media and everything we're pumped at, advertising everywhere, and we, we don't know what we want. The best thing we can do is just go and spend time with people. Go and do something you haven't done before. Go ballroom dancing. Go hiking. Just do something with people. Spend time with people. Mm. Get to know someone. Get to know how they grew up. Mm. Yeah, like uh, I'm, this is going to sound really weird. But the last couple of months have been interesting in my street. On a couple of elderly neighbours have passed away, and I've I've taken this opportunity since meeting Kylie to really go and sit with the partners. And the last week, the, yeah, last week was the last one, and I took my son up with me. And we went and sat with Alan. Uh, yeah, Alan. <laughs> Get to know my neighbours real well. Um, <laughs> I sat there with him and all they asked was, how did you two meet? Where we, and we sat and talked for a whole hour about his life with Maria. And... Like, I, I learned so much and I came home so privileged that, I, you know, I've got a wife that I love and, you know, I got to share his story and the whole time, his wife's just fast. But you asked him about his position of love. You made him come from a place of love. Mm. That's always going to be good. Good yeah. on you. Mm. That would have been just what he needed too, probably. Yeah. Well, yeah. listening to Kylie Hutchinson is, is where, where I've come from with that and I'm just, I'm so grateful. Like, I'm so wealthy because I had a conversation with him. I came home with my son, who I hugged a little bit tighter. I come home to my wife and just smile, you know? And it's just, yeah. yeah. So, sorry, I'm off track and I'm on tangent again. No, no, that's not off track. That's exactly what I'm talking you. about. Good on you. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, well done you. But this is brilliant. And usually at this point, we're looking for, you know, what sort of things to wrap the conversation up with because we've just gone over the hour, but what I was looking at, but we've actually, and thank you very much, uh, Scott, because you've given us some really great story that gave a great example to everybody, like to us and also to other people who are listening about how to move forward in this so that we get release that uh, pain that we're holding on to that's holding us back from moving forward. The compassion that you've talked about, the, you know, the forgiveness, the love and everything else, all of those things have come together. So. You know, I want to thank all three of you and that for being here today and sharing all of this and having the conversation. And I want to thank everybody else who's been uh, listening in again. I could feel that we could keep talking about this for a, <laughs> quite a long time. There's so much more to have on this. So um, I'd love to get some feedback from the people who are watching this to put their comments in and ask questions and for them to connect with all three of you as well. And you know, start to... Uh, find ways in which they can start looking at, well, how do they let go of the fear that's been holding them back? And as Scott, you've uh, found by talking to Kylie, who's been on the panel and been a dear friend of mine for, for what now, nine or 10 years, um, being able to connect and there's so many good people in the campfire that want to help mm -hmm. each other. And that's, um, you know, I take my hat off to every one of you who keep coming on the panels, who come in and have the conversations. I just want to see this thing grow more with more people in here. So. Again, thank you all three for being on here. 
So, you know, looking forward to getting you on more panel discussions. And I hope you've enjoyed yourself here today. Yeah, uh, thank you, everyone, for leaving your hearts here because it is, it's, it's your passions, it's your loves, you know, and it's, that's what changes the world, the love. We talked about it at the start. We love what we're doing. We love spending time with each other. So thank you. Thank you all. Turns even off, mate. Everybody who's been listening in today, thank you for being here, and we'll see you on the next uh, campfire panel discussion. Bye for now. Cheers. Bye.